Kathmandu, starting point for expeditions to climb Everest, is a 7,500-mile drive from Great Britain. Mick Hopkinson negotiated the narrow streets with an irreplaceable cargo, 11 handmade racing kayaks, and the only ones in Nepal. This was a unique expedition. Six Olympic-class canoeists with some outstanding firsts in whitewater canoeing to their credit, including a 220-mile descent of the Blue Nile and the first shoot of the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. They had come to Kathmandu not to climb the highest mountain in the world, but to descend the highest river in the world, the Dude Kosi. We'll be back in a moment. The British Everest Canoe Expedition had taken over 18 months to organize. It was led by Mike Jones, a 25-year-old doctor from Birmingham, England. Rob Hastings, the most stylish canoeist in the team, is a teacher. 22-year-old Dave Manby, the youngest of the seven bachelors. Roger Hyten is a Yorkshireman from Bradford, as is Mick Hopkinson, at 28, the oldest and strongest of the party. John Little, despite being a chartered accountant, received the most love letters. But choosing John Gosling, a post office catering manager, to cook the food was pure genius. From Kathmandu, the trail leads due east, crossing range after range of foothills to meet the Dude Cozy after 80 miles. The source of the river is on the Kumbu Glacier, above the Everest base camp, at an altitude of over 18,000 feet, the highest river in the world. It runs past the historic Tangbuche Monastery, Namche Bazaar, and a Jubing has fallen over 13,000 feet in its first 50 miles. 50 miles later, it meets the Sun Cozy, and becomes wide and peaceful as it flows down to the Bay of Bengal, a thousand miles away. One of the biggest risks for a canoeing expedition is to find no water in the river. Mike Jones' team wasn't going to walk for 17 days just to find a dry riverbed, so they chose to do it in September at the height of the monsoon. As the rain fell, even the most pessimistic member accepted that there'd be more than enough water for all of them. Empty, the canoes weighed 30 pounds, but full of rainwater, they were immovable. Eight days out from Kathmandu, they reached the Hillary Bridge and they saw the dude cozy for the first time. Sherpas have a healthy dislike of water and a real fear of crossing bridges, which are left unrepaired until they fall down, usually with someone on them. At the top of each ridge, the mountains came into view, but these were only of minor interest to the canoeists. While mountaineers would look up for routes, the canoeists looked down, scrutinizing every foot of the river. Is there too much water? Will we be able to do it? Four days later, they reached Namche Bazaar, the Sherpa's home village. The expedition porters were Tanangs from the lower Sun Cozy Valley. Sherpas, the aristocrats of the Himalayas, prefer to carry for climbing expeditions with tents, rope, and high altitude clothing as their perks. Slowly, Everest grew in scale until there was no mistaking it. Squat, huge, sitting firmly above the expedition's objective, the Kumbu Glacier. The snows from Everest avalanche into the western Kum and join the giant Kumbu Glacier. In summer, this melts, and somewhere on its surface, the canoeist found a lake, the real source of the Dudkozi. They had established a world's altitude record for canoeing. 17,500 feet. The ice lake gave the team some experience of high altitude paddling. Under the south face of Lhotse, the magnificent satellite peak of Everest, 
the real river began. Dave Manby led the first part with Rob Hastings, who didn't like these shallow waters at all. It was very frustrating for the first three days because it was so rocky and it was so steep. It was very difficult to, to actually paddle because there were so, so many rocks of all shapes and sizes littering the whole riverbed. And uh, because there wasn't very much water in it, it, it was difficult to actually get your paddle into the water. Soon the river steepened and the narrow gaps between the boulders forced the water into high pressure jets. Breakout points were further apart and the concentration required to avoid rocks was intense. Everest was still visible on a clear day. But as they descended, the river steepened again and became even more serious. All the time, the canoeists are looking ahead for eddies, opposing currents. There they can break out from the high speed, lung bursting, dodging between boulders. The water was just above freezing, and survival time in it could be measured in minutes. They were looking for suitable breakout points above impossible waterfalls and narrows, where the bank team could snatch a passing canoe before it swept over the fall. Ahead was the worst floodgate they'd encountered so far, and there were only two possible eddies where Rob and Roger could stop. Rob misses the first one, shoots the fall, and then makes the second. Roger Hyten wasn't so lucky. This was the nightmare that continuously haunted them. To be swept out of control for just one second too long and then jammed irretrievably under a boulder. After 20 miles, the river fell into a steep-sided gorge. Jeff Tabner, one of the climbers, made a route down so the team could get a closer look to confirm that it was navigable. Already, they had broken three canoes. And at that rate, the remaining eight canoes wouldn't see them through the next 79 miles to where the Dude Cozy meets the placid waters of the Sun Cozy. Access to the gorge was almost impossible, and the waters rushed along with tremendous force. An accident here would be unthinkable. But unconcerned by all this, Leo Dickinson, one of the cameramen, was determined to get into the perfect position where the jungle wouldn't block his view. The gorge ends where the Dude Cozy is joined by the Boot Cozy. And suddenly the expedition began to feel the full force of the river. This was whitewater canoeing at its most difficult. In the Alps and in Britain, the team had practiced on the steepest water, but the Dude Cozy falling at 270 feet per mile was over four times as steep as anything they'd met before. One essential qualification for every member of the team was to be able to recover from a capsize by rolling his canoe on the first try every time and in the fastest water. There may be no time for a second attempt. And to lose the boat and to try swimming in these conditions would be fatal. Apart from rocks, boils, and whirlpools, the most formidable obstacle is a stop away, where the water turns over on itself and can seize a canoe or a swimmer and churn him until smashed or drowned. The only way to break out is plowing through it. This is impossible in a full-size life jacket, which makes them lethal. The team's jackets were just to give them some sort of buoyancy, but not enough to trap them if they were caught in a stopper. Rob Hastings was the first to take a bath in this sort of water. I 
capsize on the first form. I realized I'll be swept into the second form before I had time to roll up, just because I hadn't got my paddle in my position. So I hung on upside down. And uh, the next thing I knew was scraping rocks on my helmet. It was here that training and practice counted. Disoriented, Rob recovered beautifully to negotiate the next fall. Sherpa kids really enjoyed the whole show. Canoeing in this sort of water calls for strength, a finely developed sense of balance, and judgment to know when to pause for a rest. Above all, it requires a cool head when situations get out of control. If you panic, uh, in a canoe, you immediately reduce the chances of your survival uh, quite drastically. Rob capsized right above a waterfall with no time to recover before he was over it. He rose up, completely lost, and headed rapidly for another impossible situation. He capsizes and rolls up again. It's exactly this sort of sequence that can lead to disaster. But Rob finally regains control. Mike Jones stopped by the adventure continues in a moment this was the biggest fall the canoeists encountered over 15 feet high with a giant stopper at the bottom once caught in that there was little chance of getting out Nick Hopkinson psyched himself up to do it like a true expert, he made it look easy. For the success and safety of the party, it was essential to operate as a team. They would follow each other through a section, then pull aside to make sure everyone was in good shape before they tackled the next. Individual brilliance was important, but if things went wrong, good teamwork could avoid a disaster. After his virtuoso performance on the waterfall, and seven years without falling out of his canoe, Mick Hopkinson was full of confidence. At the end of a long day, we'd been on the go since six o'clock, canoed for probably four hours on some really difficult water. And at the end of the day, I uh, made a mistake. I, a lapse of concentration, I capsized, I was swept sideways onto a large rock. And the water pinned the canoe against the rock I was upside down in the water. And the water was going so fast, such was the force of it, and anyway, I couldn't get out of the canoe. I was being held against the rock by the water, perhaps for 40, 50 seconds. I had to sit up, I had to get out of the boat, I had to, I had to do something. And I kept trying and trying, and eventually I realised I wasn't going to do it. And at that point, the, the boat actually bent, came off the rock, and I managed to get a breath. Mike Jones had seen what had happened. He reacted instantly. He shot downstream to get ahead of Mick, who made a frantic attempt to grab the end of his canoe. But these were extremely dangerous waters, and Mike had to look out for his own survival. It's uh, the man in the water's job to try and get hold of the, the canoe. The, the actual the canoeist can't do that much. Mike couldn't have done a great deal to, say, physically lift me onto the canoe at all. Because the water was so difficult that he had to paddle down it himself. And once I actually, even though I got hold of the canoe, I had to let go of it because we dropped into a fairly big stop of the tools. If I'd held on to his canoe, then he'd have ended up swimming as well. So I, I actually let go once. But uh, perhaps the mics would say the mic's big problem is he didn't know exactly where to go down the rapid himself because he couldn't see it. I actually opened my eyes and all I could see was, was a brown and blue colour. I was longing for the surface, you know, for, to see the sky, if you like, and I couldn't. As the canoe slid over fall after fall, Mick, bowled over and over by the water, was swept out of sight down another channel. Mike Jones, hindered by snow blindness, managed to hold his canoe across the current, and Mick, completely exhausted, grabbed the stern. I was just completely, absolutely exhausted. 
so much so that uh, just getting under his, the end of his boat was a major effort. Shocked, battered, and confused, Mick Hopkinson was pulled onto the bank. Mike Jones had just performed a classical and extremely skillful canoe rescue on technically difficult waters. Mick was very lucky to be alive. By now, most of the canoes had been damaged by smashing against rocks in the river. Every night, they were patched and reinforced, but three had already been written off. It seemed worth taking a risk to recover Mick's canoe, hoping that it might be possible to repair it. Rob recovered it. And only now was it possible to see how Mick had managed to escape from under the boulder. His struggling under the water and the sheer force of the current had split the boat apart. As a special treat, Mick was given the last brand new boat being carried by the support party with instructions to look after it this time. By now, they'd been canoeing for 10 days and had descended over 10,000 feet from the start on the Kumbu Glacier Lake. Each section of the river was inspected before a descent was attempted. Here, all the water was swept under a jammed log, a mistake upstream, and the canoeist would be wedged in his canoe under the tree trunk. The team discussed its feasibility, not wanting to repeat Mick's near-fatal swim. Finally, they took the chicken run, the easier, quiet water near the bank, with only a few canoes left serviceable, and some of those held together with tape. They were taking no chances of failure, with success so near. The river was totally relentless. Falls, haystack waves, rocks, and the ever-present thunder of rushing water. Mick and Mike take the next section of the river. Mick sees a huge stop away, but it's too late. He's swept into it, spun into a loop, and then he breaks out. Mike has cunningly avoided it. At last, the end of the steep section was in sight. They traveled 50 miles, and they descended over 13,000 feet of the steepest and most continuously difficult water anyone on the expedition had ever experienced. But they were still only halfway down. They needed to stop to repair what canoes they could and to take stock of the food, which was rapidly running out. With only two serviceable canoes left, the expedition still had 50 miles of the Dude Cozy to complete. The two Mikes volunteered to try an alpine descent through the more placid lower reaches. They set out as the rest of the party started the long trek to Kathmandu. There would be no comforting support party on the bank to help the canoeists if they got into trouble. They carried the minimum of equipment and food, a sleeping bag each, and a few bars of chocolate between them. Two thoughts filled their mind as they paddled past mile after mile of paddy fields. Where would they be able to get some hot food, even if it was only a cup of tea? And if the river really was infested with crocodiles, as the Sherpas said, where were they all hiding? They paddled for 50 miles, round bend after bend, until each curve merged into the next as a solid green wall. It seemed endless. They had arranged to be met where the Dudkozi meets the Sunkozi. It seemed a vague arrangement. But right on schedule, the helicopter appeared, and the fear of the five-day walk out to Kathmandu was eliminated. Their journey's end was really in sight. Okay. 
Elated with success, they paddled for the last time on the Dude Cozy. They had no food left, and they'd seen no crocodiles. But the expedition had successfully completed the longest canoe descent in the world. For each of the team, it was a triumph. A burnt face and swollen lips were the last mementos of the high-altitude sun. The weight they had lost would be regained once they were eating normal food. And for them all, this had been the ultimate in canoeing adventures. <laughs>